Hi, Jim Ziegler, the Alpha Dog. 20 things a general manager must do every week. This session is for general managers and dealer principals. And you know, in February of 2018, I was writing for a magazine, Auto Dealer Today, and I was writing for FNI Showroom. And in Auto Dealer Today, I, I wrote an article February 8th, uh, 2018 titled 20 things a general manager must do every week that article turned out to be the most read article in the history of that magazine the editors were absolutely amazed at how many responses we received how many how many people clicked on it and read the article it was just absolutely amazing you know a competent executive general manager can they can write their own ticket in today's world, a general manager that is an executive, fully trained, fully competent general manager can earn upwards of half a million dollars a year, a million dollars a year. They can write their own ticket, basically. Now, I know people are saying, Ziegler, wait a second. My general manager doesn't make that much, and I know a lot of general managers that don't make that much. Well, yeah, of course you do, because most general managers in dealerships today have that title on their business card, but they are not truly general managers. They're not executive general managers. They are basically glorified sales managers or general sales managers that were given the general manager title. A really truly qualified general manager has executive qualities, executive countenance. So we're gonna talk about 20 things a general manager must do every week. Now, first of all, let's, let's be clear. These are my 20 things. These are 20 priorities as I see it. There's certainly a lot of other things a general manager needs to do every week in the course of running a dealership. I mean, you can think of a lot of other projects and things other than what I elaborate in this training session. General manager is you show up early. Now, first of all, the general manager is, is the ringmaster of the circus. You are responsible for everything that happens. You're responsible for the things your employees do and don't do. So understand, you are responsible for the outcome. Accept that responsibility. Show up early every day before normal business hours. When I show up at a dealership, um, the service department is just showing up for work. Um, the office staff's not there. The sales staff's not there. The receptionist hasn't showed up yet. I show up early every single day. If you want work ethic, you're going to have to exhibit work ethic. The first thing I'm going to do, and I've done this for 45 years, is drive the lot from both directions. Drive the lot every single morning. How are you displayed? I mean, I'm going to drive up and down the street in front of the dealership. I want to see how my cars are displayed. Have we moved them lately? Understand the frontage of your dealership is a quarter of a mile, an eighth of a mile, whatever it is. That is an eighth of a mile, a quarter of a mile of billboard. All this traffic driving up and down the street every day. You need to merchandise the display of your dealership. And I'm going to tell you what, most dealerships don't move their cars for months. Trucks are in the same place. Used cars are in the same place. They didn't redisplay. They don't have elevated cars on ramps. They, they don't display the merchandise. They've got a line of trucks in the front. Well, excuse me, if you are a Chevrolet dealer, you are a Dodge dealer, you are a Nissan dealer, you are a Toyota dealer, a Ford dealer, you got big trucks, people know you have big trucks. If it's a standard F-150, like most F-150s, it is a second-line vehicle. People know you have trucks. But when you display your merchandise, I want to put off-brand, exotic sometimes, off-brand merchandise on the front line. Things that people don't expect to find in your dealership. And I want my people to understand, I expect you to move the cars continually. I expect you to redisplay the merchandise. 
I want you to think about putting the off-brand cars on the front line. Uh, elevated ramps, uh, when I'm a general manager, we're going to have three or four, five, I don't know, elevated ramps, well lit at night, with featured merchandise. I want people to drive down the street and turn their heads and go, wow, you know, is that happening in your dealership? What happened to dealerships I work for and dealerships I've worked with? We display the merchandise. And you need to redisplay it. You need to have a lot party and move your inventory continuously. And, and by the way, when you talk about display, I'm going to go a little, a little south here, but your website, the photographs on your website, do they show cars in the current environment? Well, I'm filming this right now or, or videoing this right now at the end of the summer. And some dealers still have merchandise on your website with snow on the ground and no leaves on the trees. Consumers know that th that car has lot rot. And you don't want to ever present lot rot. So I'm, when I look at the, the dealership, I drive it from both directions. I drive, I weave in and out the merchandise. I, I go in and out of the inventory. I want to see where things are parked, where how they're displaying, and we're going to have a, a conversation with the general sales manager about that. Display the merchandise. General manager drives the lot, drives through the inventory every single day early. And then when you come in, once you come into the dealership, come in through the back. Use the service entrance and speak to everybody you see. Speak to the lot, the lot crew, the people that, that clean your cars, the people that park your cars. Talk to the, the technicians. Talk, talk to everybody. Know your employees. A general manager, a competent executive general manager knows your employees. You know their problems. You know about their, their spouse. You know their children. You, you know a lot about your employees because you empathize. Remember, once again, this is a circus and I'm the ringmaster. I am responsible for keeping attitudes energetic. I am smiling. Maybe I've got some trials and tribulations in my own life, but I am smiling. I'm friendly. I'm cordial. I never, ever scowl when I walk through the dealership. I never look like that, ever. You know, positive energy. You want enthusiasm in your people, you got to be enthusiastic yourself. Never neg negative or scowling. Ask questions. Don't ever get too big for the little people. And I'm not demeaning anybody. I'm talking about the people that have the less, the less responsible jobs. I'm talking about the lot people. I'm talking about people that have the bottom, the bottom line jobs, the entry level jobs in the dealership. Talk to people. We hire a new employee. I'm going to meet every new employee the first day. Every new employee is going to meet me, be introduced to me by the sales manager. And I'm going to ask him a lot of questions about themselves, about their family. I'm going to, I'm going to be friendly, cordial. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell them all about what I believe that their future is in the dealership. I, I'm going to be, I'm a, I'm a positive pump up sort of person, tough manager, tough manager, but influential to the people. I mean, enthusiastic, you know, they, they will follow you. Okay. I finally made it to my office. I've greeted everybody with a smile and, I know my employees, uh, I'm going to pull the doc, daily operating report, the doc. I'm going to pull the CRM reports and the financial reports. And I, as a general manager, I need to know how to operate the CRM. I need to know how to operate and pull up any file in my, in my DMS. As a, as a general manager, I need to find, be able to find anything that is in our computers. I need to be as proficient as the desk people, the BDC people, the F&I people. 
I need to look at the reports and I need to see the reports every single day. And you know what? The sixth, the sixth thing I do is I call the controller office manager in my office. Every single morning, without exception, I am going to meet with a controller office manager every day. I'm going to review receivables, payables, warranty funding, rebates, obsolete parts, manufacturer programs, preferably with the office manager present. I don't want to interpret things that, let's face it, your office manager, your controller, they got their finger on the financial health of the dealership. They know what's going on. So when I'm looking at a financial statement, you need to be able to read a financial statement. If you don't know how to read a financial statement, you are not an executive general manager. And you need to know what every line item represents. You need to understand a, a, a famous general manager once said to me, Ziegler, a financial statement is like a, a knitted sweater. You go to a line item, line 21, and you start pulling on that and you're asking controller about that. Well, let me see the files. Let me see this. Let me see this. Let me see this. Why are we doing this? And you start pulling on that thread until you unravel the entire sweater. Yep. So knowing how to read a financial statement and questioning each of the line items at different times, that keeps my controller and my office on their toes. I will pull any line item and say, I want to see all the files, all the paper that goes with this. Show me in the computer, show, show me hard evidence. Okay, now, this isn't always possible. Because as a general manager, I might be called to manufacture meetings, NADA conventions, um, training sessions, 20 group meetings. I'm going to talk about 20 groups in a minute. I might be talked to, I might be called to these different meetings. I might be out of the dealership. But when I am in the dealership, I personally open all of the mail and sign all of the checks. Mr. And Mrs. General Manager, Mr. and Mrs. General Manager, if you're watching this training video right now, you personally open every piece of mail mm -hmm. and question when you get in invoices from a, a vendor. Who signed for this? What are we doing with this? Is this giving us ROI? Tell me about this. If you don't understand an invoice, you're going to get to the bottom of it. And, I want, and the reason you do that, you want your people to know that you check. Open the mail, sign the checks. Now, of course, I'm not in the dealership every day. Uh, you know, I've got other duties, meetings, and things. So sometimes my, my controller will have to assume that responsibility. But understand, I'm still, I've got my thumb right on the heartbeat of the dealership. Rally the troops. Number eight, twice a week or more, I'm going to have departmental meetings. At least twice a week. Now, that's every department management uh, a person is going to be there. I seldom ever uh, combine a variable operation with a fixed operation. I don't bring the service people into the sales meeting. No, we don't do that. So, Departmental management meetings, and once again, my controller is sitting right next to me. He or she is, is in the room, and we're going to start pulling threads. We're going to start looking at things. I've got my variable meeting. I've got my pre-owned sales manager. I've got my fleet sales, my F&I director, my BDC manager, our accounting chief, and we're going to start out with inventory aging. Inventory aging, see, people don't realize you spend a lot of time talking about aging on your used inventory. Well, you got to remember your new inventory also ages. And you need to be aware that you've got a unit that isn't selling. And it's like right now, it's about to be model year change where I'm at. You know, 
Do I have a new unit that has been on the lot for 200 days and hasn't sold? Why? What do we have to do to feature it? Used cars? I want my, my service department to be able to turn around any, any car in 72 hours. Maximum 72 hours. When we trade in a car, my service manager is not going to give that car a sun bath. Now, I generally want the sales department to pay close to retail, but if we're going to pay close to retail, we're going to get retail service. We're going to, and I, I've worked for dealers and, and worked with dealers that used to find the service manager if the car wasn't up front in 72 hours. So think about, think about that. If you, you get a $25 a day hit on your, your pay plan because you've got a car that, that isn't, unless it's waiting parts, if it's waiting for parts, that, that's excusable. But generally, I want every trade-in up front on the front line in 72 hours. So inventory aging is, is very important. I'm going to turn the cars every 60 days. There is a, a, a used car trainer. <clears throat> excuse me. There's a used car trainer, Tommy Gibbs. Now, Tommy Gibbs, uh, he and I have a lot of history back around the year 2000. He was the dealer, operating partner dealer. I don't know what exactly his title was. I, he was the dealer at Tallahassee Toyota. And he hired me to come in that dealership once a month or more. And we got that dealership up to 300 units a month. Now, I'm talking about Tallahassee, Florida. We were selling 300 units a month, and we were holding gross on those units. The gross was north of $2,500 a unit, new and used. Now, that's F&I, all, all money included. But we were, we were knocking it dead, which those were good numbers for that time in history. And Tommy and I talk about used cars all the time. Matter of fact, I'm going to have him do some training on this network. So Tommy Gibbs and I, we got a lot of a lot of history between us. And I think he's one of the most competent used car consultants out there. I used to be I used to be um, Tim Deese. Tim Deese is one of my greatest personal friends, but he's pretty much retired now. So Tommy Gibbs is the man. But anyway, let's let's get back on with it. Trade-ins. I want to know recon expense, time and service, of course. And I want to look at wholesale profits and losses. You know, should we be making a, a huge wholesale profit? I don't think so. If we're making huge wholesale profits, that might mean that we're not putting enough money in the cars to make the deals and we're losing some business. I'm going to look at my F&I penetration, my per copy, uh, per retail unit average, lease penetration. And I also want to take a note of customers that were financed for 72, 84, even more months than that. 84 months. You said, I don't want my sales department starting out at 72, 84 months on every offer they make to a consumer. A general manager is going to be aware of this. You know, we're going to have some 84-month deals. We're going to have some 72-month deals. But if we're starting every deal there, then we're expanding the term. We're, we're losing business. A 60-month loan is upside down for 3.8 years. What is an 84-month loan upside down? Think about that. Now, my background is in the variable operation. As I mentioned previously, I never was a general manager. I was a general sales manager. The reason for that is I didn't have the strength in the variable operation, the fixed, uh, excuse me, in the fixed operation. I wasn't great in the fixed operation. I didn't understand service. I, I didn't concentrate on service. So I know my weakness. And when I'm a general manager, I'm going to cover my weakness. I'm going to hire outside consultants. I'm going to join 20 groups. I'm going to hire a kick-ass general, general F, uh, excuse me, not general manager, that's me. I'm going to hire a really kick-ass service director. I'm, and I'm, I'm going to pay, pay for the right person. You know, my, my theory as a general manager is 
hire the best people and pay them too much. Don't, don't try to, don't try to account your way into a profit. Hire the best people, put them on great pay plans. It's all performance based, but I want all of my employees to have the ability to make a lot of money if they perform. We love writing big checks when they are making big checks for us. I hope that makes sense. So when we do the fixed ops meeting, I'm going to have my controller in the room and maybe a used car consultant that I, excuse used car, excuse me, uh, a fixed operations consultant that I hired. And I'm going to have my kick-ass manager there as well. So we're going to have a lot of expertise in the room and uh, I don't care if they, their, their opinions conflict, I'll make the judgment. Okay, first of all, open parts, counter tickets, and repair orders. What open, what open orders do we have in service? Especially older than 30 days. I'm going to look at the average hours per repair order. You know, per repair order, how much how many hours are we averaging? And another thing I want to know how, how many hours of additional service are, are my service writers upselling? You know, are we upselling additional items per repair order? Are we just doing doing the warranty work and not, not selling the paid work? Now, if I have a quick lube, you know, this is absolutely embarrassing. Most dealerships have a quick lube that is anything but a quick lube. You know, a little jiffy lube and take five oil changes on, you know, every corner, Valvoline oil changes on every corner in the dealership, in, in the city. Guess what? It takes hours to get in and out of a dealership's quick lube. I've seen it many times. Now, if we're going to have a quick lube, it's, damn it, it's going to be a quick lube. We're going to outservice the Take 5, the Valvoline, the Jiffy Lubes. I mean, why, why do people go to those? Because the dealership can't turn the work quick enough. I'm going to staff up my quick lube. I'm going to work on it. And, and you say, well, Jim, we do it by appointment. Valvoline doesn't need an appointment. You can just drive over there and get an oil change synthetic, regular, whatever you want. As a general manager, I am going to put pressure on my quick lube to turn those cars quickly, no appointment necessary. You know, how do we do that? Well, how does Jiffy Lube do it? That, how does Valvoline do it? How do all these people on every street corner in the city do it? So my quick lube is going to genuinely be a quick lube, no excuses, no excuses. Now, this is one thing I do as a general manager or even as a consultant today. When I'm going to dealership, I audit deal jackets. Success leaves clues. So does failure. I'm, I, I have been known as a consultant. Um, for years, I consulted Tallahassee Dodge. I mean, my, my good friend, Chuck Urban. And... First thing I do when I go into Chuck Urban's store is I would have the office pull me a hundred random deals from the month before. Get me the physical deal jackets, a hundred deal jackets. And I would go in the conference room with a legal pad and I would tear those apart. I would look at the way the deal was worked on the worksheets. Did the sales manager start at 84 months? What happened there? Do the salesperson coach the customer? I can see that with the paper trail in the deal jacket. Did F and I submit the deal correctly? Did F and I make all the money they were supposed to make? I can tear apart a deal jacket and tell you exactly what happened during that deal. And then we call the managers in and we ask them to explain why did why did this happen? Why did that happen? What about this? That is so effective when they know you're pulling a hundred random deals a month or 50 deal, random deals, 25, whatever. But when they know you're doing that, 
And they know the general manager is looking at the way they work the deals. We have processes in this dealership. Is the manager following the process? Are they working correctly through the CRM? So I'm going to audit the deal jackets at random. I'm going to work with my 20 group. Now, I'm telling you right now, you need to belong to a 20 group as a general manager. I'm, I'm saying Nichols, Campbell, Moore, NCM, or NADA. You know, pick your poison, but this is not my vacation golf outing. I, I'm not going to go to some resort location in the Bahamas, drink all evening, and have a golf outing with my buddies. No, this is a working 20 group. I, I want a 20 group that is working, a 20 group that will make me stronger and better. I want the other members to benchmark me and my dealership, uh, educate me, keep me updated on the latest things they're doing that are successful. When you've got 20 dealers that are similar in size to your dealership and you're in a 20 group, what are, what are they doing that's working? They're not my competitors because a 20 group doesn't have them all in the same city. They're, they come from different parts of the country. So when you're in a 20 group, make sure it's a working 20 group, not a vacation golf outing, drink all night in the Bahamas. No, be sure that you're in a working 20 group. Somebody that can benchmark you and challenge you, make you better at what you do. New, exciting ideas, things that are working, concepts, vendors that they like, vendors they fired. You know, you get a report on, on what's happening. You can stay current because in your own dealership, if you don't belong to a 20 group, you become inbred. You start to accept your employees' excuses. And you start to, to do things that you really shouldn't do as a general manager. So join a 20 group, working 20 group, and I'll leave it at that. Check your reputation. Reputation management today is extremely important. I'm going to check Google, Google references, and you've got to have... Google my business. You've got to have your BDC people, your, your tech people, your internet manager. They need to build up your Google my business page. There is a million things that will increase your business on the Google my business page. Call, call somebody and say, let me look at my, my Google my business page. And if it looks if half done, not done, be sure Google My Business is a major part of your advertising strategy. It will make more deals for you than virtually anything else you can do. So if I'm checking my reputation online, I'm checking Yelp, and I don't really like Yelp, but um, we, we deal with them. Dealer Raider, Edmonds, Google, there's all sorts of reputation where, where people are leaving comments about their experience with you. So as a general manager, you need to neutralize the, the bad references. That might mean you need to call the people. If it's, if it's something pretty bad, maybe you need to call the salesperson mentioned or the manager mentioned. What about this? What happened there? And by the way, your reputation is really important because people do look at that before they buy. And if you've got a, a bad reputation, it's going to really hurt you. So what you need to do now is neutralize that bad reference. Even if I have to give up some money, if it's a really bad reference, it's going to cost you more than you have to give up to satisfy the people, even if they're wrong. Even if they're wrong, Cut them off and get, make them take that down or re rewrite it in a positive review. So do that. Get that review off of there. Have the people rewrite it. I call this CSI engineering. Okay. What deals did we miss yesterday? I want my managers to call deals that we almost made. 
when I was with Dyer and Dyer Volvo back in, in the mid eighties, if a customer didn't buy a car, the very next day, a manager was on the phone with that customer if they could buy. If that was a qualified buyer and they didn't do business with us, every single day in our management meetings, we would hand out the names of those people and talk about the situation and which manager was going to call them. Managers need to call customers that didn't buy within 24 hours. I mean, that that made a lot more business, a heck of a lot more business for us. And, you know, dire and dire, we got up to 850 new and used units a month. We started out at around 60. And within a year and a half, we were at 850. Volvos, does say Volvos, think about that. Yeah, that's well documented. Now, I wasn't the general manager. I was one of the managers. I was an F&I manager at that dealership, but I was part of that team. You know, I, I wasn't the department head. I was one of the team. I was an F&I manager at that dealership, and it was Camelot. It was incredible. Okay, one thing, enforce the CRM. Customer relationship management, CRM, manage it. And every, legislate it. I started a, a, a phrase around the industry that's got, gone all around the industry, marry your CRM. That's an original Ziegler phrase. Marry your CRM. The CRM rules. I am the ringmaster of the circus and CRM is the rules. When I went into Barrington, Illinois to Motor Works about 10 years ago, that was already one of the top performing dealerships in the world, 500 or so high lines a month. I'm talking Mercedes, I'm talking Porsche, I'm talking the, the top brands. And they were their, their showroom was half as big as a football field with separate showrooms for each of the brands. And they were doing incredible high grosses already. So when I went in that dealership and I, I met with the general manager and I met with the dealer principal, Paul Tamras. And when I met with the dealer principal and the general manager, we did two things. We solidified their selling system. And the other thing we did is we looked at their CRM. Now, they were using a proprietary CRM, and we were saying, wait a minute, is this program in the CRM necessary? Is this program necessary? And we eliminated all unnecessary programs in the CRM. And then we required every employee that worked for that company to use every part of the CRM that we left in it. We had the CRM company programmers remove things we weren't using. So the CRM was custom adapted to our culture. And we solidified the selling system and we married the CRM. And I've had people say, well, Jim, that's old Joe. Old Joe is, he's not very good with computers. He can't do the CRM. Well, excuse me, if old Joe can't do the CRM, old Joe can't stay here. Because everybody is going to use the CRM exactly the way it's set up. And as a general manager, I'm going to legislate that to my managers. And it's going to trickle down to the sales department and to the service department. We're going to use the CRM. Put your ear on the track and see if there's a train coming. What do I mean by that? I'm going to listen to phone calls. One thing I'm going to do as a general manager is I'm going to listen to the recorded phone calls. I want to see how my people are handling deals on the phone. Now, I've, I've hired a company to do that. They're going to help me, you know, to translate what's good and what's bad. And they're going to, they're going to really thin that process down for me where I don't have to listen to every phone call. But I'm going to, I'm going to listen to a lot of phone calls. And by the way, I'm looking for a conversation once a week in private with a receptionist. If anybody in the dealership knows what's going on, if anybody in the dealership knows what dramas are going on in people's life, what people are upset, anybody, you know, conflicts, drama, who's pregnant, they know everything. 
the receptionist knows all the good, the bad, the ugly, the dirt. Otherwise, if you want to find out what's going on in your dealership, have a conversation with the receptionist in private. She or he knows everything that's going on. So if you have a live receptionist in your dealership, and I'm not a huge fan of deep, of complex menus. And one thing you've got to understand, the receptionist can blow more deals than any employee in the dealership. Do not put the people on voicemail. And a lot of receptionists believe it is their job to get that customer to voicemail as quick as possible. A large percentage, I don't quote specific percentages, but I'm going to say it's at least half. Half of the people you send a voicemail, hang up and don't talk to voicemail. You lose a lot of business when people won't take their calls. If I've got a sales manager or a salesperson that refuses to take their calls, they think you're going to wait for it to go to voicemail, we are going to quit that practice. You take your calls, you talk to the people, you know, do not, uh, receptionists, do not send the people to voicemail. Try to get them to the destination that they want to talk to the person they need to talk to. People do not talk to voicemail. Remember that. Okay. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to trust Google. Google is the only true measurement. Excuse me. I'm going to meet my internet, my BDC managers. I want a complete audit of our channels, how they're performing. When, when a lead comes in, how quick are we getting back to that lead? When a lead comes in, you know, there are, all, there are all kinds of studies that say when a lead comes into your dealership, if it's answered immediately, you have a great possibility of making a deal. But if that lead is not answered in 15, 20 minutes, somebody else is going to get the deal. Because, you know, when you're, when you're talking about lead providers, and I'm not a big fan of lead providers, any of them, but when you're dealing with lead providers, let's say you're dealing with TrueCar, that lead they sent you, they also sent to five other people. Five people got the same lead you got. And if your people are taking 10 or 15 minutes to answer that lead, you're losing business. And I can, I can verify that. Uh, about three years ago, two years ago, two years ago, my wife had a Cadillac SRX. Now, this car was six years old with less than 2,000 miles on it. She didn't drive it. You know, we, I drove everywhere. So she's got a six-year-old SRX with, with 2,000 miles on it. And... I went online and I went to Kelly Blue Book where a dealer makes an offer on my car. Okay, fantastic. So Kelly Blue Book got back to me and said, this is what you know you should be selling your car for. And I, and I, I booked out the car and I, I sort of agreed with it. You know, it was a low mileage, crystal clear, clean car. But okay, so anyway, I got, I got, you know, three dealers that were going to call me. The first dealer that called me was a used car lot, independent. And he called me within five minutes. I didn't hear from either of the other two. So I went over to the used car lot. They're paying what I want. And he's writing the check. And I've got the check in my hand. And the cell phone rings. Now, this is 20 or 30 minutes later. It was the Buick dealership across the street that wanted my car. And they couldn't understand why I had sold the car already, sitting right across the street from them with a check in my hand. You've got to be sure that your BDC responds to every lead, every opportunity, every inquiry. You know, is your website converting? Good. Well, the website doesn't convert. Guess what? Your BDC converts. And they need to understand that I expect that of them. I want to talk about Google AdWords. 
I want, and maybe this isn't the right person to review my advertising budget, but I'm going to look at our advertising budget online. Because right now, the most effective advertising out there is Facebook. Facebook and Marketplace are incredible for selling cars. Are we using that? Are we, are we doing a good job with it? How, how's our pay-per-click? Now, there is um, a program called SpyFu, S-P-Y-F-U. Now, SpyFu, let's just put that on the screen a second here. Okay, I'm not quick, quick typist. Let's see. There we go. WWW Spy Fu. That's like Kung Fu, only Spy Fu. www.spyfu.com. Go to spyfu.com and put your dealership in it. And it will tell you exactly how effective your AdWords are, which AdWords are not effective. And it'll show you which one of your competitors is infringing on your market, which one of them are getting, getting better internet results than you are. It'll show you what Google AdWords they're using and what organic words they're using that are effective and what they're using that's not effective. It'll even show you what they're paying for those words. So you can outbid them. SpyFu.com, like Kung Fu, only SpyFu. Um, take a look at how your dealership's performing. You'll be amazed. I showed it to a dealer one time, and he said, Jim, it came in the next day, bleary. I said, Jim, I stayed up all night looking at the stats because it's that accurate. Once again, Google Analytics is the only legitimate measurement of your internet performance. Never, ever trust statistics about a de uh, dealership's performance, about a vendor's performance that are supplied by the vendor. When a vendor gives you statistics about their performance, don't trust it. Or some company they hired to give you statistics about your, their performance. Excuse me. Do not trust statistics provided by a vendor about the vendor, <laughs> even if they have a third party do it. There's a lot of bogus stats out there. Don't listen to all this crap about attribution. Don't listen to all this crap about um, influence. We influence the sale. No, you show me the money. When, when they start telling me about attribution and influence, this is what I say to them. Show me the money. How many cars you actually sold that filled out your form and came to me through you in a lead? Don't tell me about app attribution don't tell me about influence most most of my my business actually comes from my website that's why i need a kick-ass website that is absolutely a monster and i, I generally the the ones the manufacturers tell you to, to build are, are dog crap you know you know the vendors that the, the manufacturers are in bed with don't have the best websites many times i'll have a really great website built as my primary and the, and the manufacturer recommended vendor as my secondary. Now that's just something to say, but anyway, show me the money, you know, really. <laughs> oh. Protect the data. Your data right now is being exported out of your website. There are pixels being installed on your website that vendors are stealing your customer data. They're stealing your performance data. They're selling it to third parties. Protect your data. I went to a dealer in Detroit, Chrysler dealer, and we audited what was being exported out of his website. And believe it or not, we, we, we also audited what was exported out of his CRM and DMS. There were over 70 people taking information out of, including sales that he had signed up for a long time ago. You know, 
were still in his DMS. They still had access to it, remote access to his DMS. You need to go to your DMS provider, your CRM provider, your website provider. What are you exporting off of this site? What are you exporting out of? And, you know, understand your, your inventory people that are, are placing your inventory all over the Internet. They're not doing you any big favors. As a general manager, the first thing I'm going to do is be sure that we, we have a handle on what information is being exported off of my site. Really, really important. And the next thing is stop overpaying. Don't be a sucker. Stop overpaying. I talk to 100, 1,000 car people a week on the keyboard or on the telephone. I am in communication with dealers in almost every state in the union, including Hawaii and Alaska. I have stood in a thousand showrooms. I have desk deals. I have taken ups. I have taken TOs. I've done F and I. I've done it in more than a thousand dealerships. So I've got a handle on what's going on. And when I talk to a hundred car people a week or you know, a thousand a month, whatever whatever that number is. One thing I hear is that the vendors are raping you. Not all of them, some of them. I'm not going to name them specifically, but you, you can figure out who I'm talking about. Some of the lead providers out there today are charging dealers 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 a month. And right across the street, another dealer in the same area, geographically, same market area, is paying $2,500 a month for the same services the other deal was paying six, seven, eight thousand for. The, it's the wild west, I'm telling you right now. So you need to start auditing your vendors. And if you don't like what you're hearing, cancel them. Excuse me. No vendor is indispensable. Nobody is indispensable. You can, re, you can re, replace any of them. Don't, don't get to believing that if you cancel this, you're going to lose business. I'm talking about your lead providers, the big ones. You know, they might think they're gurus, but they're, 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 they're raping you with price. So anyway, what I want you to do right now is get a handle on what they are producing. And I promise you, when you fire them and you see their ROI, I, I want to audit their true ROI cost cost per sale. And if, if they're not performing, I'm going to fire them. I'm going to cancel my contract with them. And the first thing they're going to do is send in one of their executive managers to talk you into staying. I've seen them fly in managers from the home office to keep somebody from canceling. But you stand firm, you cancel them, and you mean it. You don't, don't let your managers talk you into, into keeping that vendor. And I promise you, within a very short amount of time, that vendor will come in on bloody knees, begging you to come back at a fraction of what you were paying earlier. Every time. This isn't some of the time. This isn't conjecture. This is things I've actually seen and heard. If a vendor, if a vendor gets canceled, they will come back at a much lower, more reasonable price because their pricing is all over the board. I, I really have always threatened that I was going to put up a website called find out what other dealers You know, that some of these vendors are so interested in find out what other customers paid for the cars. Let's, Let's just make dealers aware of what other, other dealers paid for their services. It would blow your mind. So anyway, once again, ask your friends what they're paying. Cancel the vendor if you're not satisfied and be ready to move on. Don't be a sucker. Now, that was all 20 things that I would do if I bought your dealership. And, you know, I'm going to... I'm going, to, I'm going to hire a social, a, a social media a agency. I'm going to hire 
an advertising agency that is Google certified. And I'm going to be sure that, that Google cert that everybody in, in the company is Google certified. Google is the only true measurement. Google is the only true performance. Remember that. You're going to get all the the people out of your your DMS. You know, I mean, when we audited that dealer in Detroit, and we found all of those people taking information out of their DMS. Some of it was a sale they had three years ago, you know, where, where, where the traveling road show came in and got access to their DMS and nobody ever canceled it. So that traveling road show was still taking information out of the dealer's DMS and they didn't even know it. So find out who's taking information out of your DMS, out of your CRM and who is your, your website exporting data to. So I get with my webmaster, whoever built my website, exactly who are we sending information off my website to? Why are we sending it to that company? Are you being paid by that company to sell them my data? Really interesting. So we solidified the selling system. We have regular meetings to save a deal. I meet with the controller daily, the controller. I hope this has helped. 20 things a general manager needs to do every week. Now, I'm absolutely sure there are other things you can think of, but this is absolutely incredible. 20 things a general manager needs to do every week. Now, this video you're watching, if you're watching it online, it's part of my new video platform, my training platform called alphadogondemand.com. That dog is D-A-W-G, like Georgia Bulldogs. www.alphadogondemand.com. I've got this website rocking and rolling now. I've got over um, 100 hours on it so far. I've customized training by me. Old school, new school, how to work a deal. Go to, go to the website. Take a look, alphadogondemand.com. Thank you.